This is Unsung History, the podcast where we discuss people and events in American history that haven't always received a lot of attention. I'm your host, Kelly Therese Pollack. I'll start each episode with a brief introduction to the topic and then talk to someone who knows a lot more than I do. Be sure to subscribe to Unsung History on your favorite podcasting app so you never miss an episode. And please, Tell your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, maybe even strangers to listen to. During the last ice age, around 10,000 years ago, retreating glaciers left behind a body of water that would become known as Lake Illinois, and then later as Lake Michigan. The glaciers left behind more than just great lakes, however with melting ice carving a series of rivers. To the west of Lake Michigan, the Chicago River drained east to the lake, while the Des Plaines River drained west to the Mississippi River. Between the two rivers was a wetland that some people called Mud Lake. Depending on the season and the weather, Mud Lake could be dry enough to walk across, wet enough to canoe across, or anything in between. In winter, it might be frozen over. Regardless of the conditions, the portage provided a route to travel from Lake Michigan to the Gulf of Mexico, or spots along the way, for the indigenous people in the area, who perfected travel by lightweight canoes that they could carry across the several miles of the portage. When Europeans began to settle in North America, the French claimed a swath of land, eventually stretching from Canada through the Gulf of Mexico and incorporating all of the Great Lakes. In claiming the land, the French were, of course, ignoring the many indigenous nations who called the region home. In May of 1763, a fur trader named Louis Joliet, and a Jesuit priest named Jacques Marquette. Armed with reports from local Odawa and other natives, and joined by five mixed-race voyagers, set off from St. Ignace in what is now Michigan. They had been commissioned by the Governor General of New France to explore the region and search for passage to the Pacific Ocean. Joliet, Marquette, and their crew traveled from Green Bay in what is now Wisconsin, up the Fox River to the Wisconsin River, and then over to the Mississippi River, relying on native guides to keep them from losing their way. They learned from the Illinois that the Mississippi emptied into the Gulf of Mexico. But fearing a run-in with the Spanish, they turned around before they reached it. On the return trip, a group of Cascassia showed them a shorter route, via Mud Lake, also known as the Chicago Portage. At the end of the journey, Joliet headed to Quebec to report on their findings. His canoe tipped in the rapids of the St. Louis River, drowning some of his crew and destroying all of his notes and maps. Joliet persisted, reporting from memory and even suggesting that the French should build a canal at Chicago, connecting the two rivers to make the journey quicker. In fall of 1674, Marquette returned to the portage, planning to travel toward the Kaskaskia's settlements. But an abdominal illness halted his progress, and the expedition ended up wintering over at the portage, where Marquette kept a journal, recording for the first time in written record, life at the portage. Like Joliet Antoine de la Motte sur le Cadillac, the commander of Fort de Bois in St. Ignace, Michigan, and later governor of Louisiana, saw strategic potential in the French 
controlling the Chicago portage. Several French maps in the early 18th century reference Fort Chicago, but it was never to be. In 1717, French officials annexed Illinois country onto Louisiana, removing it from the governance of Canada. This realignment left the Chicago Portage as a border region, forgotten by both sides. In the 1763 Treaty of Paris, ending the Seven Years' War, the French ceded both Canada and the portion of Louisiana east of the Mississippi, including the Chicago Portage, to the British. Louisiana west of the Mississippi went to Spain. The Anishinaabeg, living near the Chicago Portage, were not parties to the treaty and had no intention of living under British rule. They attacked British traders who ventured into the area. Within two decades, the British lost the region to the Americans, ceding it to them in the 1783 Treaty of Paris that ended the American Revolution. In July 1787, the United States Congress of the Confederation enacted an ordinance for the government of the territory of the United States northwest of the River Ohio, creating the Northwest Territory which included the areas that would later become the states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and the northeastern portion of Minnesota. In the next few years, in missions to investigate the region, several explorers learned of the geographic importance of the Chicago Portage. However, the indigenous people in the area had no intention of allowing the Americans to take control. In 1791, a confederacy of Native Americans decisively defeated General Arthur St. Clair and the U.S. Army at the Battle of Wabash. George Washington demanded St. Clair's resignation and appointed Anthony Wayne in his place. Wayne's victory at the August 1794 Battle of Fallen Timbers finally marked the end of the Northwest Indian War. At the Treaty of Greenville, Wayne attempted to gain U.S. control of the Chicago Portage. He met with resistance, but managed to secure, quote, one piece of land six miles square at the mouth of the Chicago River, unquote. In 1803, the U.S. Army used that stretch of land to build Fort Dearborn, named for then U.S. Secretary of War. Henry Dearborn. During the War of 1812, Native American forces destroyed the fort in the Battle of Fort Dearborn. It was a victory for the indigenous people, but a short-lived one, as the U.S. redoubled its efforts toward Native removal. In 1816, Fort Dearborn was rebuilt. But the real key to the U.S. control of the portage was not military power, but engineering. The Americans built the first bridges across the Chicago River in 1832, began construction on an artificial harbor on Lake Michigan at the mouth of the Chicago River in 1833, and broke ground on the Illinois and Michigan Canal in 1836. These environmental transformations changed the balance of power in the region, removing any advantages the indigenous people had once had. Joining me in this episode is Dr. John William Nelson, Assistant Professor of History at Texas Tech University and author of Muddy Ground, Native Peoples, Chicago's Portage, and the Transformation of a Continent. 
Hi, John. Thanks so much for joining me today. Yes, thanks for having me, Kelly. Yeah, so I am super interested in hearing how you got into this topic, how you came to write this book. Well, I guess it's a two-part answer, right? So the, the standard answer we'll leave for a second, and that's kind of the dissertation research story behind this. But the first story is really kind of, I guess, a little bit about me and why I was interested in this topic to start with. So the book is Muddy Ground, right? And it's it's this kind of early history of Chicago as a portage, a canoe route that, that connects these waterways. And growing up in Ohio, I lived very close to the Great Lakes. Uh, so I was always fascinated with kind of the uniqueness of these, these huge freshwater seas that are right here at our back, back door as Midwesterners. And that really drew me uh, kind of as a historian, but also as just a, a kid growing up in the Midwest. And I, I spent summers as a kid going to my family cabin up in Ontario, Canada, where we would do a lot of fishing and camping, but especially a lot of canoeing. And so canoe camping is a thing that happens in Canada, right? And canoe tripping, as they call it there, where you portage from lake to lake to lake to get into the backcountry. And so I grew up doing that with my dad and, and siblings. And that kind of was the personal spark that really got me interested in the significance of these kind of canoe routes and canoe networks that seem to connect this region from, you know, the Canadian Shield to the the Illinois Prairie and, and, and everywhere in between. So that's kind of the first part of that answer. The second part of that answer is, of course, the more academic story, which is I went off to grad school wanting to do early American history. Uh, and I, I went off to grad school already having this kind of portage project in mind, but I didn't know it was going to be about Chicago. So when I started doing the research, I was interested in the canoe networks as indigenous creations in the Great Lakes as both kind of an indigenous technology, right, for fusing the region together, but also then as kind of this interactive space that both Native people and Europeans came to appreciate. So I had that in mind already when I went into grad school. But to be honest with you, that's a quite a project to bite off as a grad student. And, and my graduate advisor gave very good advice that I should narrow the project down, right? And he said, instead of writing about every portage in the Great Lakes and every canoe route and every potential meeting place between Native people and Europeans in canoes, let's focus it in on, on kind of a significant historical site that you can extrapolate out from, right? Almost like a micro history of these canoe networks and this kind of freshwater mobility from one vantage point. And the vantage point ended up being a perfect one at Chicago. And that's how kind of the story of Muddy Ground started from kind of an academic idea and a personal idea into a doable and feasible and digestible project, not just for me to complete, but hopefully for readers to, to get through and, and, and take something away from yeah, so I love the way you put it in the book that you're going to stake out this vantage point and sort of see history go by. So that sounds easy in a way, right? Like you're going to be in one place. I assume that the research is not easy because there is not a single archive in which everything to do with the Chicago Portage is going to be. So can you tell me some about what that research looks like? What are the kinds of sources? This is multiple different nations have this region at various kinds, plus the early indigenous time. So, you know, like, what does this actually look like to do? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. And, and that's what really hooked me. Once I started to dig more into Chicago, I realized that not a whole lot had been written on it during the colonial period, during the early American period. And it's because it's not a site of European control, right? It is definitively under indigenous control much longer than other sites in the Great Lakes that we might think of as important to early American history. So Detroit or Niagara or, or Michilimackinac, right? These places that become fortified by Europeans, French, and then British very early on and generate their own written archives, right? So you know where to go for the Detroit papers, right? You know where to go for the, for the papers from Fort Niagara. Chicago is not like that because it's not a site of European power, it's a site of indigenous power. And so it became a 
a giant puzzle of tracking down scattered sources, referencing Chicago and the canoe route running through Chicago, but not necessarily all collected into one specific archive. And so I actually did quite a bit of research on the ground in what I would call kind of regional archives and even international ones. So I spent time at the Library and Archives Canada, right, which doesn't naturally come to mind as a, a rich archive for Chicago. And yet, both between French fur trade documents and then eventually British fur trade documents that are flowing up through the Great Lakes, they end up in Ottawa, Canada eventually. So I spent time there. I spent time, minimal time, I will say, uh, through digital archives in French and British sources. I spent uh, a lot of time in Wisconsin and Chicago itself. So the Newberry and the Chicago History Museum have managed to collect some local uh, papers now, but it's kind of after the fact. So I did a whole year as a graduate scholar in residence at the Newberry that was really formative to the project. And it was great to write from Chicago. But I also then spent much time in Michigan and Pennsylvania and Indiana, kind of at these, again, regional archives where there are historical sources collected there that are being generated from not necessarily from Chicago, but about Chicago. And that's really what I had to do to kind of pull these sources together. And at the end of the project, looking back, right, there's, there's American sources, which are kind of the expected ones, but there are a lot of inter-imperial sources too. So French for the early period, British for kind of the revolutionary period. And unexpectedly to me, I used more Spanish sources than I, than I would have guessed because the Spanish are in St. Louis through you know the 1790s, almost 1800, right? And they are generating sources from, from St. Louis about the Illinois country and about places like Chicago as they interact with Native people there. So that kind of archival hodgepodge kind of had to be quilted together to make sense of this story. And then the indigenous side of it only adds to the kind of the intrigue and the interest for me, because there are multiple indigenous groups that live in Chicago, travel through Chicago, and uh, for which Chicago is a very important site. And so figuring out that indigenous history became a complicated part of this story too. And that, you know, goes beyond just archives. And that involves kind of ethno-historical methods. Um, so digging into the anthropology and the archaeology and older ethnographies about Native people and their relationship to Chicago was important. One particular Indigenous person that really baffled me for a long time is this Indigenous Anishinaabe headman from the Revolutionary War era named Siganok, right? And to get back at your archival question, this leader of kind of the Chicago area, Anishinaabe, went by different names to different European powers, right? So the Americans always call him Blackbird. The British call him Siganok. The French call him Le Tourneau, which is kind of a rough translation of the Starling or another kind of Blackbird. And then the Spanish totally butcher it. They call him El Heterno just because it sounds like Le Tourneau. And so it took me a while to figure out that, hey, this guy is actually the same guy that the Spanish are talking about, the British are talking about, French fur traders are talking about, and Americans are talking about. They're just all referring to him as different names. And he lives in the Chicago area. So that kind of is a microcosm of some of the detective work that went into figuring out all of these different people talking about the, the indigenous folks at this place and then also the space itself uh, from all of these different vantage points. So I want to talk some about these indigenous groups. You mentioned there are several of them. I live in Chicago, and so I have done that exercise of like land acknowledgement, trying to figure out, and it's hard in Chicago because there's just a lot of different groups. So can you talk a little bit about why that is, why this isn't a place that there's just like a group that claims? Yeah, well, it's complicated history because of Chicago as a crossroads, right? So part of what makes Chicago so significant to so many different indigenous groups is that it was, long before Europeans arrived, a kind of an intersection of interaction and, and an intersection of movement. So because Chicago sits at this low, low-lying continental divide, right, between the Mississippi watershed and the Great Lakes, Indigenous people have been using this space as kind of an amphibious 
point of movement between the Great Lakes and the Illinois River Valley for centuries. And long before Europeans arrived, I think it was a, a crossover point, right? And the archaeology kind of hints at this, right? There are multiple overlapping kind of cultural signals in the archaeological record, even before Europeans get involved, that hints that there are kind of layers of indigenous history here and layers of indigenous mobility here. That only becomes exacerbated once Europeans get involved and these kind of cycles of violence play out between indigenous groups vis-a-vis -vis one another and indigenous groups vis-a-vis -vis Europeans. So, for instance, in the, in the 17th century, right, at kind of the moment of French contact, there are multiple groups kind of traveling through Chicago without necessarily any one group living there. So you have reports of Meskwakis, or, or what are known as Fox Indians. The Illinois, obviously, are a huge powerhouse downriver from Chicago. Uh, Miami-speaking people are traveling through and kind of varyingly settling the area. Uh, off and on throughout the 17th century. And then by the 18th century, you have kind of more powerful arrivals like the Anishinaabe who really come in and make Chicago part of their homeland. But that doesn't really happen until the mid 18th century. And so because of that, we have almost dozens of groups in which Chicago is significant to them, not necessarily just as a site of settlement, but also as a site of movement. Because again, this is kind of a no man's land crossroads for much of the, the historical period where different indigenous groups are traveling through Chicago, relying on its portage, relying on its kind of wetlands resources, but not necessarily living in the local area. And so a land acknowledgement becomes very complicated when you factor in that some of these groups are passing through, whereas other groups are trying to settle long term. And all of those groups see Chicago as significant to their life way. And so it's very hard to start arguing, well, is this Anishinaabe homeland? Is this Meskwaki homeland? Is this Il Illinois homeland? It's, it's all of the above, right, at different times and in different ways because of how they use the landscape and travel through it. So let's talk about that actual traveling, what the experience of going through this portage is and why it worked so well for the indigenous people and then maybe didn't quite work the way the French or Spanish or British or Americans would have hoped. Yes. This again kind of goes back to that, that story of indigenous power and indigenous technological advances, right? So native people in the Great Lakes had kind of perfected canoe travel without any input from Europeans. And when I say perfected canoe travel, I'm talking about lightweight birch bark canoes. These are canoes that had the potential to carry 10 or 12 people at times, along with hundreds of pounds of gear, if necessary, and yet were lightweight enough that you could carry these things between waterways. And the, the real advantage to the birch bark canoe is that wherever you go in the Great Lakes region, the very southern extremities being maybe the exception, there are birch trees growing, paper birch, right? You can picture the white birch trees that you can strip bark off and make repairs as you go. So in these accounts of uh, indigenous travel that we get from like Jesuit missionaries who are traveling with them or fur traders or, or early French kind of officials that, that observe the travel, native people are traveling in these birch bark canoes. They'll pull into shore at night, and they will make repairs almost on a daily basis to keep their lightweight birch bark craft uh, ship shape and, and moving through the region. Now, they didn't cross the broad lakes, right? Uh, so don't picture birch bark canoes, you know, kind of losing sight of land. They kind of coasted along the sides of the lakes to avoid storms. They could rush to shore as needed if a gale popped up or something like that. But the real kind of genius of these things is the, is the lightweight portability of them and the fact that Native people could, if they knew the geography well enough, get to shore or get to the end of a river or get to kind of the, the, the stopping point of a body of water, pick up their canoe and carry it along with their gear to the next watershed. And that's what makes Chicago such a vital kind of portage connection 
in this, this network of mobility because it is the lowest and shortest continental divide between the Great Lakes watershed and the Mississippi watershed, Native people kind of came to value it for its connectability, right? You could sit at Chicago and in theory only have a couple miles. You could carry your birch bark canoe either into the headwaters of the Des Plaines and the Illinois River that would get you to the Mississippi and all the way to the Gulf Coast if you wanted to. Or you could go the other way, carry your canoe into the Chicago River drainage into Lake Michigan and, and reach the Gulf of St. Lawrence eventually with a couple of short portages along the route. And so that's what makes it super vital to indigenous forms of mobility. Of course, when the Europeans get involved, things change, right? So the Europeans almost immediately understand the strategic significance of a place like Chicago because it is a connection point. It can unite the waters of the continent. That's how the French kind of describe the, the strategic geography of the area. What the French don't kind of master, and, and I would say most Europeans don't for, for most of the period I'm talking about in the book, is, is this kind of indigenous method of travel. So the French come in and they immediately think they're either going to A, build a canal here, or B, dig a harbor and rely on kind of European shipping, right? La Salle is one of these early French adventurers who builds a European-style vessel on Lake Michigan with the plan of, of kind of connecting the Great Lakes through kind of a, a European maritime network. And yet, it becomes difficult to have that reality play out on the ground, right? The portage as a wetlands landscape always stymies kind of European efforts to master it. And the Griffin, LaSalle ship, goes down in a gale, breaks apart, we think, on a sandbar in the Great Lakes almost as soon as it's built. And so that, that vision of a French maritime empire in the Great Lakes never quite reaches fruition because they're not quite willing to embrace the fluidity of these indigenous forms of technology the fluidity of these indigenous uh, networks of mobility that hinge on birch bark canoes and and uh, portages like Chicago. It seemed like such an interesting moment of like, how would history have been different when the French are thinking about maybe we should build a settlement or build a fort or something at Chicago. And then it seems like it, the People in France are like, oh, we'll just split this region in two. We don't need to think about this as a central place. So can you talk a little bit about that and you know what what it might have meant for the French if they they had actually had maybe they wouldn't have been able to control it even if they tried to, but like what what that could have meant? No, it's a, I mean it's really interesting, right? Because you do have you, as as historians, we never like to go counterfactual, but we don't have to in this case. Because we have other examples of successful French fortifications and settlements elsewhere in the Great Lakes. So I think, you know, had the French followed through on this these kind of advice from the periphery, if you will, right, as French officers are writing back and saying, we need a fort at Chicago, we need a, a presence at Chicago. If they had followed through and if they had somehow navigated the, the indigenous geopolitics of the region better and, and established kind of permanent presence at Chicago. I think Chicago would have ended up kind of going the, the trajectory of a place like Detroit, right? Or, or Mackinac, which become these kind of European hubs in an otherwise indigenous landscape, right? And, and it would have been kind of this, this outpost of French power deep in the, the, the interior, maybe kind of like St. Louis ends up being for kind of the Spanish era or places like Detroit or Michel and Mackinac end up being for the French. But that's not the way it goes, right? Like you say, the French imperial wisdom of the day splits New France, which is, becomes Canada and the Great Lakes, from Louisiana and Illinois. And that boundary line goes right through what will become Chicago, so that it really does become this kind of imperial borderland or an imperial no man's land in between kind of French centers of power, meaning that that officials in Canada are happy to say, well, Chicago is your problem now. And people in Louisiana are happy to say, well, Chicago is your problem now. And it kind of falls through the cracks, right? To the point where it allows 
both indigenous resistors to find a space there for kind of much of the 18th century, but also clandestine smugglers, right? So it's the only major portage route that is not fortified successfully by the French Empire in the Great Lakes region. And because of that, it becomes kind of a thriving hub of smugglers or what the French called courier de bois, right? These woods runners that are basically illegally trading with indigenous people against French wishes, uh, which is really kind of interesting to think about, right? Kind of Chicago is this den of of thieves and, you know, indigenous freedom fighters and all this stuff. Like it's kind of a, a romantic picture of mid 18th century Chicago that I don't think we know a whole lot about, right? Because there's not a lot of records about it, except for these French officials complaining about it. But it does it does kind of spark the imagination. I think Chicagoans would be very happy to claim that history. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So eventually then this is taken this area is taken over by the British instead of the French. And the British seem to have even less idea about what to do with this region. Like what did they just not understand that this was a potentially significant area? What what's happening with the British? Well, I think there's a couple things going on, right? So the British come in and claim this region by conquest after the Seven Years' War. And for probably the first, I don't know, seven or eight years after they have claimed this region, they're trying to get a handle on it, right? And this is true not just at Chicago. It's true at Michilimackinac, Detroit, and throughout the Great Lakes and Ohio country. And they, they have some severe setbacks early on in the ways indigenous people challenge their authority to this region. Obviously, Pontiac's War is kind of the famous example of this. But even after that particular war of resistance is over in 1763, there's kind of low-level violence at places like Chicago, or at least the threat of ongoing indigenous resistance that make the British very weak when it comes to being on the ground, right? There's a map in the book that I'm so happy to find, right, of a British cartographer who tries to map Lake Michigan. And he only gets to draw half of the lake because he's scared of the indigenous people living in the other half of the lake, right? And like, so Chicago gets left off the British imperial map of of the time because indigenous power is so strong in places like Chicago and British claims are so tenuous. And of course, that gets compounded eventually by the budgetary cuts of the British Empire, right, leading up to American independence. And then, of course, the actual moment of colonial rebellion means that the British are lucky to hold on to Canada, let alone places like Chicago or the Illinois country. And so it it very much is kind of this tenuous moment of imperial claims that quickly falls away because the British are kind of incapable of expanding their imperial agenda this far inland, I think. And so then, of course, we have the Americans, and Americans come in and do what Americans do and just say, we'll just change the whole landscape. Right. right. (laughs) Make it work for us. This doesn't work for us. Great. We'll just change it. So can you talk a little bit about that that different approach and, and how it from my view, it's successful, right? I'm sitting here in Chicago, which is a, a bustling city, but you know, it, it's perhaps a, an interesting approach that that they took. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it, particularly interesting is the fact that it almost takes the Americans two tries to figure out how they're going to conquer this space, right? At first, they come in. In the 1790s, they claim this space as part of the Greenville Treaty sessions in, in 1795. And their plans initially, are to follow French and British attempts at fortifying the the portage route. And so, you know, in 1803, they build the fort, they try to garrison and police movement through Chicago in the early 1800s. And this really backfires on them in kind of a very violent way by the time we get to the War of 1812, when local Anishinaabe, especially the Potawatomi of the Chicago region, are resentful of the American presence there, and they use the war with Britain as a good excuse to, you know, attack the retreating American garrison and burn the fort to the ground, right? Kind of resisting that American presence. 
So that didn't work super well for the Americans, right? That kind of old imperial approach to how you're going to control this space doesn't play out well. And so when the Americans come back in, in 1816, kind of first attempts and 1818, 1819, as statehood comes into effect and an American presence returns to the, to the portage and, and a fort is rebuilt there, the Americans have kind of this new plan in play, right? That they're going to essentially rewrite the landscape. Eventually, they're going to dig a canal. But even before that, they're going to survey the land. They're going to measure out plots of land where they can dig this canal They're going to plan out harbor improvements so that it's no longer just a canoe river. You can get European-style shipping into it. They they reroute the river. You know, a hundred years later, famously, they're going to redirect the flow of the river. So, so the kind of engineering that makes Chicago famous really starts in the 1820s as an American effort to say, okay, this indigenous geography doesn't work for us. It doesn't work for the way we want to control this space. And so rather than simply conquering the indigenous people that live here, we're going to, quote unquote, conquer space, right? That's the kind of the famous John C. Calhoun quote uh, that I use in the book to describe the American project of basically flooding this place with infrastructure to the point where it's unrecognizable. It undermines the power of, of the Anishinaabe, right, this indigenous the kind of local indigenous presence that had controlled movement through the portage now finds themselves suddenly powerless or near there because the environment has been reshaped, the geography has been reshaped, and now Americans control the landscape and the river and movement here and can call the shots. And that really is kind of the the big shifting dynamic that kind of moves power from indigenous people at Chicago to an American settler state, right? And by the 1830s, that shift has happened. And it's happened in kind of the most anticlimactic way, right? This is not a big military victory. This is not uh, a dramatic conquest of any kind. It is literally state-backed infrastructure projects that undermine the geographic power of, of Chicago's native people. Yeah, it's so interesting. I mean, it seems thinking like in retrospect, it's like, well, of course, Chicago is going to be a hub. It's this ideal location. Of course, it, you know, is going to be a major city. But that was in no way obvious. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not geographically determined in some way, right? It is absolutely by chance and, and by luck that the Americans pull this great coup off, right? Yeah. Coup against nature, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to ask a little bit, I saw on your website that you're thinking about your next project. And so I wonder if you could just briefly talk a little bit about, you know, sort of where you're going next. Yeah. So, you know, this project was very place-based and, and I, I think different historians have different styles, right? And, and I think my style, as you, as you research and write, you figure this out. And I, I'm a, kind of an in the weeds guy, and I don't want to say that too loud, but I do really like the particular and the specific, right? And so for this project, it was very place based, and I could focus in on Chicago and talk about these much larger processes that were playing out across the continent, but in this kind of contained, localized space of Chicago. This next project, I think, is going to be contained in a different way. It's going to be about a specific group of people. And and I stumbled on this second project doing research for the first project. And and I guess I'll describe the project and then I'll I'll describe its connection to Chicago because there is still kind of a Chicago connection. So I'm interested in these so-called white renegades of the revolutionary frontier, right? And this is the term that's used at the time to describe individuals who are essentially white settlers that cross over and end up living and many times fighting with Native people against the incoming United States. And this happens kind of in the revolutionary moment in places like the Ohio country, the Kentucky frontier, that sort of thing. But these individuals, these so-called white renegades, they, they survive the era of the Revolutionary War, and they continue to kind of defy cultural expectations and, and racial allegiances 
decades after American independence. And so as I was digging into the early history of Chicago, a few names like this popped up. John Kinsey is kind of the most famous, right? There's a, you can picture Kinsey Street and uh, Kinsey gets kicked around in Chicago history, right? But before Kinsey is lauded at this, as this kind of white founder of Chicago, he's a blacksmith living in an indigenous town in the Ohio country repairing guns for native warriors that are fighting in the United States, right? And his loyalties, even in the kind of Chicago era, John Kinsey moment, are sketchy at best, right? He's got some connections to British Canada. He certainly has connections to local indigenous groups. He nominally claims US citizenship, but he's only one of these guys. And so several of them work their way through Chicago. Billy Caldwell would be another kind of mixed race individual that would fit this Bill. William Wells, who famously dies at at the Battle of Fort Dearborn, is another person who would fit this kind of shifting allegiance over his lifetime. So I'm interested in exploring these lives and and what makes these individuals tick. So I've got kind of a handful of, of eight or 10 of these folks that keep popping up in the archival record from the revolutionary moment forward. And, and some of them are women and some of them are men, which is super interesting. Some of them are full-on white settlers that go and fight with Native people. Some of them are intermarried or of mixed race origin. All of them, right, kind of defy our expectations and, and don't side with the U.S. on the frontier, right? They, they kind of continue to be uh, somewhere in between or vehemently in the camp of Native resistors in, throughout the Midwest, throughout the Great Lakes region, in Chicago itself. And so tracing their lives, I think, will be a really kind of interesting people-based project to understand just how complex loyalty was in the borderlands of early America, how complex identity was in the borderlands of early America. And it kind of gives us a window to talk about the exclusionary uh, efforts of the revolutionary moment on the frontier while at the same time recognizing that there are individuals that don't want to go along with that kind of racial exclusion that comes after independence. And that's really interesting to me. Well, I think everyone should go read Muddy Ground. And uh, especially if you love Chicago, and I know a lot of people who listen probably love Chicago. So how can people get a copy? So it's available anywhere you buy books. There are I know of several bookstores in the Chicago area. They have copies. And if they don't have copies, go to your favorite bookstore and ask them to order copies. It's through UNC Press. So you can also, of course, purchase the book at the University of North Carolina Press. It's available in hard copy and uh, paperback, which is great. Of course, you can also get it on kind of online vendors like Amazon, etc. So uh, it's available anywhere you want to get your books. If you don't want to purchase it. You can also, of course, uh, implore your local library or your university library to buy a copy and get it that way. So yes, buy the book, uh, read about Chicago. I am, of course, always available to answer questions. I, I love getting emails from people who have read the book already and are excited to ask me details about Chicago's early history. Is there anything else you wanted to make sure we talk about? Perhaps kind of the environmental side to all this, right? So I think Chicago's story is really interesting, not just because it's a story about American conquest and indigenous dispossession, but also because it is wrapped up in kind of the environmental realities of that kind of colonial moment, but also today's realities of kind of environmental concern, right? So when we talk about environmental justice, we usually talk about it in kind of 21st century context. And I think what the story of Muddy Ground tells us or or hints at is that environmental conquest has always been part of kind of the settler colonial project, right? Always been part of the U.S. conquest story. And we haven't necessarily always paid attention to kind of the environmental side of colonization. Chicago gives us a great window to look at that because the U.S. overhauls the landscape of Chicago in such a dramatic fashion. But this happens everywhere on the continent, right, in different ways where 
U.S. settlers and the U.S. state undermine indigenous environments and weaken indigenous power by doing so. And so I think that that kind of environmental element is relevant even today when we talk about land acknowledgments at places like Chicago, an indigenous presence at Chicago, the city today, and also the environmental concerns that that a city like Chicago faces in the 21st century, right? There are rising lake levels, there are sinking wetlands, there are flooded basements, and all of that has connections to this history that I think is worth paying attention to, right? And, and worth thinking about in kind of its long historical context, because none of this happened overnight, right? And it's all wrapped up together. Well, John, thank you so much. This has been great. I really enjoyed the book and I've enjoyed speaking with you. This has been great, Kelly. Thanks so much. Uh, You're a great host and thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Unsung History. Please subscribe to Unsung History on your favorite podcasting app. You can find the sources used for this episode in a full episode transcript at unsunghistorypodcast.com. To the best of our knowledge, all audio and images used by Unsung History are in the public domain or are used with permission. You can find us on Twitter or Instagram at unsung underscore underscore history or on Facebook at Unsung History Podcast. To contact us with questions, corrections, praise, or episode suggestions, please email kelly at unsunghistorypodcast.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate, review, and tell everyone you know. Bye! M-S-W.